It's good to see everyone here this afternoon. Let's begin with a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, we're thankful for this day. We're thankful for this time in which we can assemble together as your children to worship you. We pray, Father, that we always do things that are acceptable to you, for that is our desire. We are mindful, Father, of those who are unable to be out with us, and we pray for them and for those who are caring for them. We pray for John as he will bring a lesson in a few minutes that he will do so in a way in which we can follow along with him and study along with him, that we can gain more knowledge, that we can learn more of your word, that we can apply it to our lives and that we can teach others the, the gospel of your son, Jesus Christ. We are so very thankful for this country. It allows us this great freedom. We're thankful, Father, for your son. And it is through his name that we pray. Amen. Number 424, 424. <clears throat> of one the Lord has made the race, through one has come the fall.
you want to follow along with with the scripture reading, we're reading from Romans the twelfth chap twelfth chapter, starting in verse seventeen through the end of the chapter. It says there, recompense to no man evil for evil, provide things honest in the sight of all men. If it be possible, as much as lieth in you, live peaceably with all men. Dearly beloved, avenge not, avenge not yourselves, but rather give place unto wrath. For it is written, vengeance, vengeance is mine, I will repay, saith the Lord. Therefore, if thine enemy hunger, feed him. If he thirst, give him drink. For in so doing, thou shalt heap coals of fire on his head. Be not overcome of evil, but overcome evil with good. Let's pray. Our gracious Heavenly Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Father, we come before you this afternoon thanking you for the blessings of this day, thanking you, Father, for the privilege to be able to gather here as children of thine to worship thee in spirit and in truth. We thank thee, Father, so very much for you, the great God of heaven, the creator of all, the giver of all blessings of life. We're especially thankful for thy dear son, whom thou didst send into this earth to die that cruel death on the cross in our stead. We thank you for his precious blood that was shed. We thank you for salvation through him. We thank you, Father, for the Bible that we have to learn from, for the message that it, it carries for us, Father, and how to live our lives to serve thee faithfully. We're so thankful, Father, for blessing us with John and his family, his wife, Alicia, and their sons, Father, and all that they do. We pray that you continue to be with them and to bless them with many years' nice service. We're thankful for our elders, Father, that, that rule over us here. We're so thankful for the way they do it in a loving and kind and gentle way, but yet enforcing the Bible, Father, so that we are doing things according to thy word. We pray that you would be with them. We thank you for their wives who support them and let them serve. We pray that you continue to be with them and to bless them with the strength that they need to carry on. We're mindful of our elder, our deacons and the, and the work that they do and their wives, Father. We're so thankful for them and all that they do. We pray you continue to be with them and to bless them as well. Father, we're mindful that there are those among us who are sick and can't be out with us. We pray that you'd be with Rich as he has a fever, that you would help him to get rid of that, that he might be out with us again soon. We continue to remember Daryl and his struggles, Father, and, and Betty. We pray that you'd be with her as well and Pete as they tend to her needs. We're mindful of Ella, Father, as she is in a nursing home or assisted living. We pray that you would be with her and to bless those who tend to her needs. Father, we're mindful of the world that we live in, how corrupt and evil it is. We pray, Father, for those who are in positions of authority, Father, that they might look to, to thy word for the guidance instead of going by what they think is best. We pray, Father, for those who are overseas serving in the churches of Christ. We pray that you'd be with them and to bless them that they might do it in a way, Father, that many souls would be brought into thee. Father, we thank you now for the, the time that we have together. We pray that we would listen as for eternity, keeping our eyes focused on the cross and Jesus as he was crucified for us. And Father, we living our lives in such a way that people would see that shining light in us out in the world and ask of, of the hope that is within us, Father, that we can take them to thy word. Invite them to come to church with us, Father, that they might learn and grow and respond to the need, Father, to be baptized. Father, we pray that you'd be with John now as he is about to break the bread of life into us. We know, Father, he will use book, chapter, and verse. Again, Father, we're so thankful for the work that he does. Again, Father, we thank you for so much for Jesus. It's in his name that we pray. Amen. Quickly stand, mark your books at number 344. Number 344, that will be a song of invitation after the lesson. After marking that, turn to number 377. Number 377. <clears throat> Number 377. Listen. When we behold the wonders of creation, 
Good afternoon. Welcome. Good to be with you. Good to see you. We're glad you're here. Invite you to take your Bible and join me in Matthew chapter 5 as a basis for our study. I'm going to read beginning in verse 38. In the midst of the great Sermon on the Mount, Jesus proclaimed, You have heard that it hath been said, an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. What I say unto you that resist not evil, but whosoever shall smite thee on thy right cheek... It might be the inclination of many to smite him again and maybe even on both cheeks. But notice what the Lord said. Turn to him the other also. And if any man will sue thee at the law and take away thy coat, let him have thy cloak also. And whosoever shall compel thee to go a mile, go with him twain, that is two. Give to him that asketh thee and of from him that would borrow of thee, turn not thou away. You have heard that it hath been said, Thou shalt love thy neighbor and hate thine enemy. But I say unto you, Love your enemies, bless them that curse you, do good to them that hate you, and pray for them which despitefully use you and persecute you, that ye may be the children of your Father which is in heaven. For he maketh his Son to rise on the evil and on the good, and sendeth rain on the just and on the unjust. For if ye love them which love you, what reward have ye? Do not even the publicans the same? And if ye you salute your brethren only, what do ye more than others? Do not even the publicans so? Be ye therefore perfect, 
even as your Father, which is in heaven, is perfect. That's Matthew 5, 38 through 48. In this brief reading, Jesus makes it clear that his disciples are not to return evil for evil, but to return good for evil. Paul taught a similar message in Romans chapter 12 in our reading from verses 17 through 21, and thank you for the good reading, in which we're reminded not to recompense evil for evil, that we are to live peaceably with all men, not to avenge ourselves, but rather give place unto wrath. And he quoted from the Old Testament where it was written, Vengeance is mine, I'll repay, saith the Lord. We were instructed, if thine enemy hunger, feed him. If he thirst, give him drink. And the apostle said in verse 21, Be not overcome of evil, but overcome evil with good. Peter wrote in a similar fashion to the elect scattered throughout the first century in 1 Peter chapter 3 and verse 9 when he said, Not rendering evil for evil or railing for railing, but contrarywise blessing, knowing that ye are there unto call, that ye should inherit a blessing. What do all these texts have in common? Teaching us to return good for evil. What I'd like for us to do this afternoon is call attention to some who did just that, who were evil treated and could have returned evil for evil. They could have retaliated. They could have taken vengeance in their own hands, but... They practiced the principles that were set forth in the reading of Matthew, Romans, and 1 Peter. As we think about some who return good for evil, let's begin in the book of Genesis with a young man who was mistreated by his brothers. His name, Joseph. In Genesis chapter 37, we read where Joseph was sent on an errand by his father. And in verse 18, when they saw him afar off, that is his brethren, even before he came near unto them, they conspired against him to slay him. And they said one to another, Behold, this dreamer cometh. They refer to him as a dreamer because he shared with them his dreams. And verse 5, Joseph dreamed, a dream, and he told it to his brethren, and they hated him yet the more. He said, We were binding sheaves in the field, and lo, my sheaf arose and also stood upright. And behold, your sheaves stood round about and made obeisance to my sheaf. And his brethren said to him, Shalt thou indeed reign over us, or shalt thou need have dominion over us? And they hated him yet the more for his dreams and for his words. And then he dreamed yet another dream and told it to his brethren. Behold, the sun, the moon, the eleven stars made obeisance to me, and he told it to his father and to his brethren. His father rebuked him and said, What is this dream that thou hast dreamed? Shall I and thy mother and thy brethren indeed come to bow down ourselves to thee and to the earth? And his brethren envied him, but his father observed the saying. And so this dreamer cometh. And in verse 20, his brethren said, Come now, therefore, and let us slay him and cast him into some pit. And we will say, some evil beast hath devoured him, and we shall see what will become of his dreams. Reuben delivered him out of their hands, and as a result, in verse 24, they took him and cast him into a pit. And in verse 25, see their heartless, callous character toward their brother when they sat down to eat bread, and they lifted up their eyes and looked, and behold, a company of Ishmaelites came from Gilead with their camels bearing spicery and balm and myrrh, going to carry it down to Egypt. And Judah said unto his brethren, What profit is it if we slay our brother and conceal his blood? Come, let us sell him to the Ishmaelites. Let not our hand be upon him, for he is our brother and our flesh. And his brethren were content. And so when Midianite merchant men passed by, they drew and lifted up Joseph out of the pit and sold Joseph to the Ishmaelites for 20 pieces of silver. And they brought Joseph into Egypt. And as the story unfolds, you realize that indeed they did bow down before their brother, that those dreams came to fruition, even though their thought was that by the actions that they were taking, that those things would not happen. 
we shall see what will become of his dreams. And indeed, they did see what would become of his dreams as God and his providence worked through Joseph in a time of great famine to bring protection to that family. And God would fulfill his promise that was made to the patriarch Abraham that in him all families of the earth would be blessed. But when their father Israel died, his sons who sold Joseph into slavery feared that now Joseph would take vengeance upon them. Several chapters later, years later, in chapter 50 and in verse 15, when Joseph's brethren saw that their father was dead, they said, Joseph will peradventure hate us and will certainly requite us all the evil which we did unto him. And they sent a messenger unto Joseph, saying, Thy father did command before he died, saying, So shall ye say unto Joseph, Forgive, I pray thee now, the trespass of thy brethren, and their sin, for they did unto thee evil. And now we pray thee, forgive the trespass of the servants of the God of thy father. And Joseph wept when they spake unto him. And his brethren also went and fell down before his face, and they said, Behold, we be thy servants. And now in verse 19, Joseph said unto them, What's Joseph going to say? Is Joseph going to return evil for their evil? Is he going to return good for their evil? What's he going to do? How's he going to respond to all of that? Is he going to take vengeance upon them as they fear? Joseph said unto them in verse 19, Fear not, for am I in the place of God? Joseph recognized that vengeance was not his, that vengeance belonged to the Lord, didn't he? He said, As for you, ye thought evil against me, but God meant it unto good to bring to pass as it is this day to save much people alive. If you had been Joseph, would you have recognized God's providence at work? Would you have recognized that though they thought evil, that God meant it unto good? Do we realize that God is able even to turn the evil that people imagine against us into good? That it may be their intent to curse us, but God can turn that into a blessing. They would have destroyed him, but God used that plot to save much people alive. He went on to say in verse 21, Now therefore fear ye not, I will nourish you and your little ones. And he comforted them and spake kindly unto them. What a great example of an individual who practiced the principles that we've just read, returning good for evil. A second example comes to us during the period of the divided kingdom where we read of Naaman the leper in 2 Kings chapter 5. We're familiar with Naaman. Some of the heroes in this story are people that we don't even know their names. We're familiar with Naaman and Elisha the prophet. But notice those in the background that stand out like the messengers that came to Naaman. And how the, they said unto him, My father, if the prophet had bid thee do some great thing, wouldst thou not have done it? How much rather then when he said to thee, Wash and be clean? We don't know the name of those servants that were involved in that, but they were principal characters, weren't they? They were unsung heroes, if you will. And there's another such unsung hero in this story. In verse 1, when the Bible says, Now Naaman, captain of the host of the king of Syria, was a great man with his master and honorable, because by him the Lord had given deliverance unto Syria, but he was a mighty man of valor and a leper. And the Syrians had gone out by companies and had brought away captive out of the land of Israel a little maid, and she waited on Naaman's wife. I suggest that this little maid is one of the heroes in this story. We don't know her name. She's just identified as... A little maid. But she goes down in history as one who returned good free. Well, here she was brought away captive out of the land of Israel. And this time finds her waiting on Naaman's wife. But notice how that instead of returning evil for evil or taking vengeance upon her captor, that she returns good for evil. She said unto her mistress in verse 3, Would God my Lord were with the prophet that is in Samaria? for he would recover him of his leprosy. She recognized that there was a prophet of God that was able to recover him 
of his leprosy. She could have had the mentality, just let him stay in his leprosy. After all, she'd been brought away captive. But she was returning good for evil. And as a result of that, we read where provision was made for her captor to be cleansed of his leprosy. We would not read, undoubtedly, in verse 14, where his flesh came again like unto the flesh of a little child, and he was clean if it hadn't been for this little maid and the good that she returned for her captor. Here this Hebrew maid blessed her captor. But another example in the Old Testament where good was returned for evil is when we read where David spared Saul. You recall the decline of Saul and the rise of David? That came about in 1 Samuel chapter 17 when Goliath's challenge was accepted by David. David said in 1 Samuel 17 and in verse 26, as the men of Israel fled and were sore afraid, who is this uncircumcised Philistine that he should defy the armies of the living God? And in verse 32, David said, Let no man's heart fail because of him. Thy servant will go and fight with this Philistine. And he went with his trust in the Lord. Verse 37, the Lord that delivered me out of the paw of the lion and out of the paw of the bear, he will deliver me out of the hand of this Philistine. He viewed this giant as no greater challenge than what he had faced when it came to a lion or a bear. And as the Lord had delivered them, him then, he would deliver him on this occasion. And he said in verse 45, I come to thee in the name of of the Lord of hosts, the God of the armies of Israel, whom thou hast defied. That all the earth may know that there is a God in Israel. Verse 46. He said, the battle is the Lord's. He will give you into our hands. Verse 47. That's exactly what happened when David put his hand in his bag, took a stone, slang it, smote the Philistine in his forehead, the stone sunk into his forehead and he fell upon his face to the earth. So David prevailed over the Philistine with a sling and with a stone and smote the Philistine and slew him. But there was no sword in the hand of David. Now, through no fault of his own, just through putting his trust in the Lord and accepting this Philistine's challenge, that arouses the jealousy of Saul. In chapter 18 and in verse 7, Notice how the women answered as they played and said, Saul hath slain his thousands and David his ten thousands. So they only attributed thousands to Saul, but ten thousands to David. And as a result of that, Saul was very wroth. The saying displeased him. And verse 9 reports, Saul eyed David from that day in forward. In fact, verse 11 reports, Saul cast the javelin, for he said, I'll smite even David to the wall. With it, So he sought to slay David. And as you read in verse 29, Saul became David's enemy continually. And here he is king over Israel, and you have the king as your enemy. And yet we find on not just one occasion, but multiple occasions where David spared Saul. He had the opportunity to take vengeance to return evil for evil, but he didn't do that. First, he spares him in the cave in 1 Samuel chapter 24. In verse 3, when he came to the sheep coats, by the way, where was a cave, Saul went in to cover his feet, and David and his men remained in the sides of the cave. And the men of David said unto him, Behold the day of which the Lord said unto thee, Behold, I will deliver thine enemy into thine hand, that thou mayest do to him as it shall seem good unto thee. Then David arose and cut off the skirt of Saul's robe privily. And as you drop down in verse 9, David said to Saul, Wherefore hearest thou men's words, saying, Behold, David seeketh thy hurt. Behold, this day thine eyes have seen how that the Lord had delivered thee today into mine hand in the cave, and some bade me kill thee. Lesser men would have done that. They would have taken the life of the king. But he said, I will not put forth mine hand against my Lord, for he is the Lord's anointed. Moreover, my father, see, yea, see the skirt of thy robe in my hand. Notice the respect that he shows toward this one who sought his life. 
He refers to him as the Lord's anointed. He refers to him as my father. He said, For in that I cut off the skirt of thy robe and killed thee not. Know thou and see that there is neither evil nor transgression in mine hand. Nor, He said, I have not sinned against thee, yet thou huntest my soul to take it. The Lord judge between me and thee, and the Lord avenge me of thee, but mine hand shall not be upon thee. And so he had the disposition that vengeance belonged to God. It wasn't his place to retaliate or to execute vengeance. My hand should not be upon him. And as he had done speaking, notice he said to David in verse 17, Thou art more righteous than I, for thou hast rewarded me good, whereas I have rewarded the evil. It couldn't have been said any better than those words that were uttered by Saul himself. And he recognized that David had rewarded him good, for his evil. So when you think about examples of some who return good for evil, what a classic example of David sparing Saul. But that's not the only time he did that. He spared him in the wilderness as you turn over to chapter 26 and in verse 5 when David arose and came to the place where Saul had pitched. That's the wilderness of Ziph, verse 2. And David beheld the place where Saul lay. And Abner, the son of Ner, the captain of his host, and Saul lay in the trench and the people pitched round about him. Then answered David and said to Himelech the Hittite and to Abishai the son of Zariah, brother to Joab, saying, Who will go down with me to Saul to the camp? And Abishai said, I will go down with thee. So David and Abishai came to the people by night, and behold, Saul lay sleeping within the trench, and his spear stuck in the ground at his bolster, and Abner and the people lay around about him. Then said Abishai to David, God hath delivered thine enemy into thine hand this day. Now therefore let me smite him. I pray thee, with the spear even to the earth at once, and I will not smite him the second time. You know, Saul, or David rather, had the attitude before, let not my hand be upon him. And so here, what about Abishai? Let his hand be upon him, right? Let him take care of this for me. Is that David's attitude? Notice verse 9, he said to Abishai, destroy him not, for who can stretch forth his hand against the Lord's anointed and be guiltless? So here Abishai would have taken his life, but David withstands him from doing that. He said, as the Lord liveth, the Lord shall smite him, or his day shall come to die, or he shall descend into battle and perish. In other words, the Lord will take care of this. Vengeance belongs to the Lord. It's not our place. It's not in our hands to, uh, to do that. The Lord forbid that I should stretch forth mine hand against the Lord's anointed, but I pray thee, take thou now the spear that is at his bolster in the cruise of water, and let us go. So David took the spear and the cruise of water from Saul's bolster, and they got them away, and no man saw it nor knew it, neither awake, for they were all asleep because of deep sleep from the Lord was fallen upon them. And then as you read down in verse 17, when Saul knew David's voice, he said, Wherefore doth my Lord thus pursue after his servant? For what have I done, or what evil is in mine hand? Now therefore I pray thee, let my Lord the king hear the words of his servant. If the Lord hath stirred thee up against me, let him accept an offering. But if they be the children of men, cursed be they before the Lord, for they have driven me out this day from biding in the inheritance of the Lord, saying, Go serve other gods. Now therefore let not my blood fall to the earth before the face of the Lord, for the king of Israel has come out to seek a flea, as when one doth hunt a partridge, in the mountains. And Saul said, I have sinned. I have played the fool and have erred exceedingly. And David said, Behold the king's spear. Let one of the young men come over and fetch it. The Lord rendered every man his righteousness and his faithfulness. For the Lord delivered thee into my hand today, but I would not stretch forth mine hand against the Lord's anointed. And behold, as thy life was much set by this day in mine eyes, so let my life be much set by in the eyes of the Lord, and let him deliver me out of all tribulation. What a scene. As you think about an illustration where you have an example of one returning good for you, when Saul was spared by David. But also when I think about examples of some who return good for evil. I come to the New Testament and I think about Stephen, the first Christian that was martyred 
were murdered that we read about in the book of Acts. In Acts chapter 6, we find this man of God mentioned among those who were appointed to serve tables in the church at Jerusalem when some widows were reported as having been neglected in the daily ministration. And the twelve, that is the apostles, called the multitude of the disciples unto them and said, It is not reason that we should leave the word of God and serve tables. Wherefore, brethren, look ye out among you seven men of honest report, full of the Holy Ghost and wisdom, whom we may appoint over this business. That's Acts 6, 1 through 3. And among those that were appointed, as the saying pleased the whole multitude, according to verse 5, was Stephen. They chose Stephen, and he is reported as being a man full of faith and of the Holy Ghost. And in verse 8, we find where Stephen, full of faith and power, did great wonders and miracles among the people. Then, in the latter part of Acts chapter 6, notice that there were those who were disputing with Stephen. Verse 10 says they were not able to resist the wisdom and the spirit by which he spake. And so they couldn't answer his spiritual arguments. And so what do they do? They, they attack him personally. They suborn men, that is, they hired men, which said, we have heard him speak blasphemous words against us and against God. They're raising up false witnesses. We've observed in our study of the book of Proverbs how God feels about that. All the things have been said about a false witness. And they stir up the people, the elders and the scribes, and came upon him and caught him and brought him to the council. Now, it wasn't Stephen that was causing the stir. It was these they didn't like what he was saying. They couldn't resist. They couldn't answer his arguments. They couldn't answer his teaching. And so they set up false witnesses which said, This man ceaseth not to speak blasphemous words against this holy place in the law. He hadn't done that. These were false witnesses. For we have heard him say that this Jesus of Nazareth shall destroy this place and shall change the customs which Moses delivered us. And all that sat in the council looking steadfastly on him saw his face that had been the face of of an angel. And so he's falsely accused of speaking blasphemous words. And what we have now in chapter 7 is really Stephen's answer to the accusation of blasphemy. And it is a sermon. It's a beautiful sermon that gives a great overview of the Old Testament. And they didn't like it. You have individuals who really illustrate what Paul talked about in 2 Timothy chapter 4 when he charged Timothy to preach the word, to be instant in season, out of season. He talked about some who would turn away their ears from the truth and be turned into fables. And certainly those who heard Stephen's answer turned away their ears from the truth. In verse 54, when they heard these things, they were cut to the heart and they gnashed on him with their teeth. Verse 57 says, they cried out with a loud voice and stopped their ears and ran upon him with one accord. And notice how he was evilly treated. He just faced this false accusation by men that had been suborned to false witness. And then they cast him out of the city. Verse 58 and stoned him. The witnesses laid down their clothes at a young man's feet whose name was Saul, and they stoned Stephen. And while he's being stoned, what's he doing? Calling upon God and saying, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. And in that moment, he kneeled down and cried with a loud voice, Lord, lay not this sin to their charge. Could you have done that if you'd been Stephen? Would you have prayed, Lord, lay not this sin to their charge. Here's Stephen, return good for evil by praying for his murderers. They've accused him of things that he's not guilty of, and they're stoning him, and as he's drawing his last breath, he's praying for his murderers. Lord, lay not this sin to their charge. That's what you call returning good for evil. One more example. Come with me this time to Matthew chapter 27. And notice with me beginning in verse 28. Where the Bible says of Jesus, they stripped him and put on him 
a scarlet robe. And when they had planted a crown of thorns, they put it upon his head and he read in his right hand. And they bowed the knee before him and mocked him, saying, Hail, King of the Jews. They spit upon him, took the reed and smote him on the head. After that, they had mocked him. They took the robe off from him and put his own raiment on him and led him away to crucify him. Then as you drop down in verse 34, they gave him vinegar to drink, mingled with gall. Verse 35, they crucified him and parted his garments, casting lots. Verse 37, set up over his head his accusation written, this is Jesus, the King of the Jews. And then verse 39, they that passed by reviled him, wagging their heads, and saying, thou that destroyest the temple and buildest it in three days, save thyself. If thou be the Son of God, come down from the cross. No doubt in my mind he could have come down. But he stayed on the cross. They said he saved others. Himself he cannot save, verse 42. If he be the king of Israel, let him now come down from the cross, and we will believe him. He trusted in God. Let him deliver him now, if he will have him. For he said, I am the Son of God. The thieves also, which were crucified with him, cast the same in his teeth. Notice the evil treatment that Jesus suffered. from being stripped of his raiment to the thieves casting the same in his teeth, verse 28 through 44. Yet in Luke's account in chapter 23 and in verse 34, we have recorded one of the seven sayings of Jesus from the cross. What did Jesus say? Father, forgive them, for they know not what... They do. Would you have been able to say as Jesus did, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. He didn't just pray for them. He went a step further even. He laid down his life for them. Have you thought about that? In John 15, 13, Jesus said, Greater love hath no man than this, that a man lay down his life for his friends. You're my friends if you do whatsoever I command you. Paul wrote the saints in Rome in chapter 5 and verse 7 saying, For scarcely for a righteous man will one die. Yet peradventure for a good man some would even dare to die. But God commendeth his love toward us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Much more than being now justified by his blood, we should be saved from wrath through him. For if when we were enemies, we were reconciled to God by the death of his son, much more being reconciled, we should be saved by his life. No greater example of returning good for evil than when Jesus prayed and died for his enemies. It's really a reminder of what Luke says when he opens with these words in the book of Acts chapter 1 and verse 1, the former treaties have I made, O Theophilus, of all that Jesus began both to do and teach. Jesus didn't teach what he didn't do. He did first and then taught. He taught his disciples to return good for evil. And he did that himself, didn't he? He expressed that on the cross when he prayed, Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. And his death is an enduring illustration of one who returned good for evil. And really his first act as king on David's throne was to pardon their sins. In Acts chapter 2, you recall the sermon that Peter preached, how that Jesus said that in Jerusalem, remission of sins will be preached in his name among all nations. And Peter preached that Jesus was raised up to sit on David's throne. Acts 2 and in verse 30. He accused them of having taken Jesus with wicked hands and having crucified and slain. Verse 23. He prayed, Father, forgive them. And when they heard this, they were pricked in their heart and said, What shall we do? And Peter said in verse 38, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the mission of sins. And then in verse 41, They that gladly received his word were baptized. 
He said, ye have taken with wicked hands of crucified and slain, and yet they were given the opportunity to have their sins forgiven. Father, forgive them. And now as the gospel is being preached, they have the opportunity to be forgiven. And they were forgiven. As many as gladly received his word and were baptized. Let us overcome evil with good as we find illustrated in these examples. Like Joseph, who blessed his brothers, the Hebrew maid, who blessed her captor, David, who spared Saul, Stephen, who prayed for his murderers, and our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, who prayed and died for his enemies. The Lord, in his teaching, warned that we may experience evil treatment, particularly from the world. In fact, we should expect that. John said in 1 John 3 and in verse 13, Marvel not, my brethren, if the world hate you. And in 1 Peter chapter 4 and in verse 4, Peter said, Wherein they think it strange that you run not with them to the same excess of right, speaking evil of you. We've suffered evil. We've experienced evil, perhaps, from people in the world. But have we begun to experience the kind of evil that we've talked about tonight? Have you had somebody hunting you as game like Saul did David? Have you been cast into a pit by your brethren or sold into slavery? Have you had false accusations brought against you in, to the extent that you're being stoned to death? Have they put you on a cross? like they did Jesus. And yet in all these examples, you think of the evil that they experienced and the good that was returned. Can we not return good for the evil that we experience today that perhaps is on a much lesser level than what we read about? I don't know about you, but it challenges me when it comes to the evil that we experience from time to time at the hands of men to as... Paul said, not be overcome with evil. And it can be overcoming if we let it. If we allow it to overcome us, it will. But to overcome evil with good, and the way we do that is by responding like Jesus did. And we certainly have that example. As Peter said in 1 Peter chapter 2.21, For even here in two were ye called, because Christ also suffered for us, leaving us an example that ye should follow his steps, who did no sin, neither was guile found in his mouth, who when he was reviled, reviled not again. When he suffered, he threatened not, but committed himself to him that judgeth righteously. Let's follow his steps. Let's not allow the evil that people send our way to cause us to sin. Let there be no guile in our mouth. And when we're reviled, let's have the strength of character, the fortitude to not get down on that level. To be bigger than that. To revile not again. To not threaten. But let's commit ourselves to him that judgeth righteously. Realizing that vengeance is not ours. To give place to wrath. As God said, vengeance is mine. I will repay. Thank you for listening and hope that something said will be helpful to you. Don't always know what is going on in people's lives, what you're dealing with, but hopefully something said will be helpful to you in your present circumstances. Should there be one or more in this afternoon's study that is not yet a child of God, a Christian, all things are ready, that you might put on Christ today. God's offering you the same opportunity to have your sins forgiven that he did to those who put to death his son. They had taken Jesus and had crucified and slain. You may say, I've not done that. We sing a song, I'm the one. You know, every time I sin on earth, I'm the one. That said crucified. And through sin that has been committed, transgression of law, 1 John 3, 4, acts of unrighteousness, 1 John 5, 17, I have just as much need as they did of being forgiven. 
And I need to recognize that. And I need to let the preaching of the Word of God penetrate my heart and convict me to allow my conscience to be smitten and stricken and to say, what shall we do? We sang a song earlier about him being the potter and we're being the clay. And we need to have that disposition as Saul lay there trembling on the earth. Lord, what wilt thou have me to do? And whatever it is he'd have us to do about that, to rise and do it. And he said, arise and be baptized, Acts 22, 16, or as Acts 2, 38 said, repent and be baptized. And if that's your need, you stand in need of doing that, why don't you arise and be baptized this afternoon? Everything is ready. There's water in the baptistry. There's clothing. Everything, it couldn't be any more convenient for you than it is right now. As we stand and sing the song, if you just step out and come to the front, would you be willing to Make the good confession. I believe that Jesus Christ, the Son of God, and upon the confession of your faith, will go down to the water, baptize you, come up out of the water. And like the Ethiopian Acts 8, you can go on your way rejoicing. That your sins are forgiven, that you've been added to the church by the Lord. You're in Christ. You have the hope and promise of eternal life. And should the Lord require your soul tonight, you can have the peace and confidence that all is well with your soul. Maybe you've obeyed the gospel, but you've not been what you need to be. And you need forgiveness as much as the individual who's not been baptized because you've turned again. As Peter described, the sow that was washed her wallowing in the mire. You've been wallowing in the mire. You need to get up out of the muck and the mire of sin. And God in His grace has extended to you a lifeline through repentance and confession. If you repent and ask for His forgiveness, as together we stand and sing, won't you go?
Let's pray. Our Father in heaven, we're grateful for this privilege we've had to assemble ourselves together, to come together with those who love thee and love one another and are committed to living as the Bible teaches. Help us, Father, to walk closer to thee each day, and we pray that thou lead us in the footsteps of Jesus. Help us to forgive others. Help us to recognize that vengeance does not belong to us. Help us to return good for evil. We're mindful of our loved ones who are unable to be with us today and those who are here that don't feel the best to suffer with the infirmities of the flesh. It's our prayer that you'll be with each and every one. And we pray now that you would dismiss us in that loving care. For it's in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen.